we are having good evening i am uh, samita midigaspe uh, some of you may know me i work at the silon electricity board and uh, i have about more than 20 years experience now serving in ceb so that is maybe one of the reasons why isl has been asking the last two years now maybe this is the fourth or the fifth time every year price making this presentation uh, just for a start uh, today we have relatively a lesser crowd how many are you from the state sector government semi government uh, government owned companies okay we have a fair number of uh, representatives from the private sector as well uh, during my presentation okay we are starting 7 5 15 uh, so we will go in until 7 15 maybe we'll have a five minutes break in the middle if time permits uh, during the lecture also you can ask a question in in not in any language in single or english uh, i will try to answer and otherwise at the end and during the we don't have a point right seems today no? The overview of the power system, of the Sri Lankan power system, uh, historical development, institutional overview, power system related uh, networks in CEB in Sri Lanka, the power generation aspects, tariffs, the future plans, key issues I will be touching on. So first going into the overview of the country and power sector, these figures of course some are relevant or all of our rel uh, them are relevant but as i have been doing in so many times even in cb when i talk to junior engineers or even to my fellow engineers and also in these lectures what i have been, I have been trying to emphasize is the importance of understanding about the macro situation and how you should uh, remember or understand the figures that is the importance because you have so many data and especially in today's context where you know at a fingertip you can find uh, all the data of course through the internet or the web or whatever the, the gadget you have in your hand the data is available to you anyway so what at, in vast amount so what you should remember is actually a li very little but still to understand and comprehend things you should have an awareness of the size of things when you are talking on about something with somebody when we say <coughs> we went in sri lanka when we say we went far but yesterday i had a long trip the long trip maybe more than just 100 kilometers could be but in the same context if you take it outside into another country maybe in us or australia i had a long trip is definitely more than 500 kilometers or something like that so you have to cut think of the context and also the figures what does figures means and how much figures should we remember and the other thing is what always you should have an idea as engineers as managers you should have an idea of the macro level because sometimes we are working maybe we are special in some agencies in some organizations we specialize we start the career in a even in electrical engineering or civil engineering or in whatever aspect we start at one place and continue to specialize in the same field same subfield same subtopic maybe and after some time we are only engaging in that aspect maybe in that software that theory or maybe not even in the theory then we may be out of context in the engineering field but we should have an awareness of where in the total picture we fit in so that is important when you are doing your job also try to fit in in whatever your organization where do i fit in what is my role and where does it fit in the macro picture of the organization from engineering perspective and also in the country from engineering then economic then from the total picture so that is important for engineers and in that aspect uh, remembering or learning the figures is important but what is important is you should not try to remember exact figures that you cannot do maybe your age 
your spouse's sage, the children's sage, I don't know because I forget, I don't know about you. So that is the maximum maybe you can remember, the date of birth of course you may have to remember, but other things exact figures it is very difficult. Engineering is not an exact science, no? if I remember one of our, my professor, our professors, Professor Karnaratna, Sam Karnaratna was always telling that the difference between mathematics and engineering is mathematics is an exact science, engineering is approximation. So you, what we should know is or un, have knowledge is about a approximate. So Sri Lanka's population definitely you should know. You should have awareness that the Sri Lanka's population is somewhere around 20 million. If some, but we, I, you cannot remember whether it is 20.1, 20.2. Now it is today when I was checking, I found that it has gone from 20.6 to 20.9. But still, it does not matter. I know that it is somewhere around 20 million. That is what is important. In Australia is also something like that in that 20 or 30 or 40. That is what I can remember. But when somebody says that Japan is maybe 50 million or 100 million, I don't know. I know to compare Sri Lanka's population and that country's population. When somebody says about a per capita in, in Japan, this much of amount was consumed and when you have to compare, you have to compare apples and apples. If this population, you have to know or have an awareness how much times the Japanese population is. You are trying to export something to Japan or you are engaging in a conversation with a Japanese consultant about some rate in Japan or or a per or a the total production in Japan or something like that. Then you have to compare. To compare, of course, you don't know the Japanese population, so you can ask him, but you can't ask him the Sri Lankan population. That is the thing. So you should have an awareness. And also, in where is it? Two million, twenty million, two hundred million, or hundred million. You should have, be aware that it is, it is somewhere around twenty million population. And the area, of course, because we have been learning this. Of course, I think most of you are still the people who may have, you know, not of the internet age when you were at school. So you would have sort of learned by heart at upon the Aston City Stegai Varga kilometer and those things uh, for the quizzes at school and that type of thing. Of course, today's kids won't know even this by heart. That's well. And the GDP per capita again, it is 3924 last year according to Central Bank report. And again, what we have to understand is that the the, the figure where it is, not the exact figure that you cannot. We are so we are now very close to 4,000. About uh, six or seven years ago, maybe 10 years ago, one of the aims of the government, the policies of that time, the government was to achieve 4,000 GDP. So, once again, in the electricity sector, also, when you are answering your questions or even for your day to day activities as a professional, or for your living as a professional, in the electricity sector also, you may be from other sectors, from civil or others. Maybe the electricity people will need to know more to go into detail. But everybody should have a awareness, even to write your answers in the paper, in the B paper. You cannot remember all these figures, but especially the figures here, you should have some awareness that the Sri Lanka's installed capita capacity is around 3,000. It is now 3,200 because last month or two months ago we purchased a temporary. It is 3,200 plus another 100. But those things, another power plant is about to retire. So that, those things, it's not in the public domain as soon as it happens. So you would not know. But you should be aware that it is somewhere around 3,000. That is something I think you, it is relevant for you. The capacity mixes. Hydrothermal, hydro is 40%, thermal is 60%, that is the capacity, that is the, in megawatt terms, in energy terms it varies, because that depends on the amount of energy each year that is produced. So, last year it was 50-50, but it varies from 40-60 for both sides. Some time ago I will show you, it was 40% for hydro, another time it was 40% for thermal, and this time last year it was 50-50, actually thermal was a little higher. So once again, that, that is the way, so this between 40 and 60, the last few years, this energy mix between thermal and actually should not be, we should not say hydrothermal, we should be saying renewable and thermal sources. The peak demand, the maximum recorded peak was recorded in March last year when we were having those heat waves and also the, all the issues in the, with the power supply breakdowns in, I think this was in somewhere early March or mid March. And 
and peak demand was 2,900 sorry 2,393 so you should have some awareness that the capacity of the car installed capacity of all together is in the range of 3,000 while the peak demand is more than 2,000 so that is something you should be aware of the country we as we know that the population is somewhere around 20 million now it's coming to 21 million like that and energy generation was 13,000 odd and energy sales 11,786 once again it is you can think of 13,000 generated 12,000 sold and another about 1,000 lost losses so it is 9.96 10 percent this is not the country's losses this is the CEB's losses we we have to adjust it to leco losses leco's losses are not there but it will be somewhere around in the region so in this range so easy figure to remember Sri Lanka's transmission and distribution loss is in the range of 10 percent this is a very good figure so that is something positive in the electricity sector that you can think of 10 percent losses is something that uh, people in even in uh, South Asia other countries and even in South East Asia Thailand Vietnam those countries are also not still dreaming about Singapore will definitely have but countries like large countries like Malaysia so in some states it's not achieved 10 percent in 2000 Sri Lanka's losses were 21 percent so we have come down drastically a very good achievement in the electricity resource sector so that is a positive of course we hear here not so many negatives about the electricity sector but that is a positive electrification level is 98.5 so that is another positive we have heard so much about it in the tv but of course whether uh, we hear it from a political viewpoint or from a professional viewpoint it's a truth and it is also once again a good achievement and the per capita consumption is 562 that is relatively low to compare to other countries even india has a higher per capita consumption even though india's uh, electricity electrification is in the range of only 60 percent so that is a question one you you can ask why is that that shows a disparity in our electricity usage in sri lanka the industry sector is using around only 30 I, i'm not sure the figure i can't remember but the around 20 percent if i remember correctly somewhere around that range same as the commercial the domestic is the highest use So that is the issue in the uh, electricity sector in Sri Lanka, in, in, in India, comparative to India, Sri Lanka, India's industry, there are large uh, energy intensive, electricity intensive industries. So relative to Sri Lanka, India's industries share in electricity usage is high. Because of that, a large amount of electricity is used, the per capita consumption is higher. So those are the things that you may have of some use. In, when thinking about policies in the electricity sector so these are just figures we have dispatchable capacity i have noted down the presentation will be available i think for you later uh, once again as i said the total is around 3000 of which about 1300 is from hydro and the balance maybe 1800 or you can remember as 2000 from the thermal this 825 call is 900 megawatt uh, gross capacity but because of its internal users the net capacity is around 825 and the other 1050 is private uh, is thermal power uh, oil fired which is about 50 51 can say C IPP has 500 at the moment CB has 550 so that makes once again this 3000 rem just remember about 1000 more than 1000 is from hydro something just below 2000 is from thermal of that 2000 close to 900 around 800 is from coal the balance is from oil so those are the things that maybe for this uh, to answer the energy paper the, uh, sorry the energy question you may you will have to somewhat have in your mind but not the exact figures don't try to remember the exact figures because there are so many figures in everywhere in the electro in the energy sector in the infra, uh, other petroleum sectors telecommunication sectors everywhere the non-conventional renewable energy so that is the uh, new energy or intermittent sources mini hydro wind though those add up to 400 around 450 exactly 467 as of 31st may now this is the 
generation share of the last one minute okay generation share of the last uh, six years I have of course put here maybe the percentage the share the share you would see of oil is decreasing and the hydro share is changing the hydro and the plus the wind, uh, the other renewables wind and other renewables that is basically wind and biomass so you, you are saying that Sri Lanka as of now or maybe about uh, last until maybe last week or so uh, Sri Lanka's elect, uh, energy policy was that uh, until a certain period is until a decision is made we would be replacing or using coal as the next option of fuel for the base load operations because it is the uh, of the imported fuels the, the uh, fuel with the least cost and with the implementation of the coal plant in 2011 you are seeing an increase of percentage and about 35 percent of the country's electricity requirement was produced by the Norachole coal plant. So the so much abused and so much talked about coal plant actually supplied 35 percent of the country's electricity demand, energy demand last year. So that is a positive aspect I would say with the negative aspect being its uh, failures or the trippings that you are hearing so much about but when it's working you don't hear, you don't uh, get that news. The news comes from things like this where that you will see that in 2015 oil produced only about 15 percent of the uh, yes something around 15 percent of the country's requirement when in 2010 and 11 it was around 50 percent. So that is a positive move that we have made since the last 10 years or that we have moved from coal from oil to coal a cheaper uh, solution a cheaper fuel. This is the 2015 share uh, figures more illustratively. Yes, 37 percent from uh, major hydro and 34 percent from coal. So, coal is matching major hydro last year, maybe it will go more, more this year. We do not know, depends on the hydro. Uh, last year was a good hydro year, as you would say, 50 around 51 percent came from. Uh, renewable sources sorry thermal sources almost 50 percent came from renewable sources oil is uh, 17 percent uh, wind 3 percent 0.5 close to 0.5 from the other sources so that is the country's present uh, electricity share the energy sh electricity generation share according to sources you can term it renewable non-renewable then renewable oil and coal different ways you can uh, check it so this is the basic what is important is that we are seeing a certain percentage of increase in coal uh, 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 important contribution from coal and last year an important contribution from hydro as well this is the demand variation in a day of the country because this is also an important aspect that we have to understand in Sri Lanka's electricity industry. If you have uh, forgotten your basic electrical engineering, you would know that in alternating current which we use in our day to day life, which the uh, utilities, the, whether it is CEB or LECO is supplying to you, there is no storage. In AC, in the electricity, you cannot store that we all know. You can store only at the source. It has to be either so stored as a hydropower as water in a reservoir up there or as a fuel or you have you another way of uh, which is coming which is being talked about as popular is pump storage which you would have heard but anyway the basics are water in a hydro reservoir up somewhere or as fuel otherwise you cannot store electricity only the source can be uh, store and that you have to think in the this and that you have to think in the same context or compare this is the basic uh, this has not changed drastically maybe last two years it is uh, changing a little bit I will tell you uh, can you see the mouse point here 
because I don't have the pointer. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So from this, we can all can say or understand what we are doing from midnight to three thirty or four o'clock. We are all sleeping, and from four four thirty, there is about by six o'clock. There is a hun about hundred percent increase, something close to hundred percent increase from five hundred to thousand. Of course, these figures change by year and per every day also. This is typical for a working day. On a weekday, this would be more flat. That is the morning peak, as see we would call it. The morning peak is a presumed uh, is a peak, uh, or not even though not as considerable as the evening peak, but it is a protruding peak which we can see. So. After six o'clock, we all switch off and start going to work, to school, everywhere. So that is why this is coming down. Then we all go back to work. We, we all go to work office, and we are starting up our uh, office, factories, and everything, putting up the switches, lights, air conditions, and all that. And in the lunch time there is a slip here so some people concerned about electricity or some people because their management is very restrictive or very strict they will switch off their lights or their equipment during the lunch break and once again work so around from 3:30 we are starting to go off Maybe the factories are shutting down, or our people are, you know, going and queuing near the register, register or whatever. By 4:30, the day peak or the sorry, the daytime of uh, dip has started. Around 5:30, we start or the electricity networks gets really busy. From something around 1,500, sorry, about 1,250. It goes up to something close to 1,700 in this graph. So it is almost again around 100% or a 75% increase. Sometimes it is almost close to 1,000 some days, some years back. So that is when we start at home, and there is a pronounced peak during this three hours, starting from here to here. And this is where Sri Lanka's maximum peak is between 6:30 to 9:30. And, and so much of from this 1700 to 1750 according to this graph about 750 megawatts of machines are necessary to supply this for four hours so that is specifically for those four hours that is what we call peaking plants so that is where our uh, load pattern is a detrimental factor to sort of a in cost wise because we have to use high cost machines it for, because and we are we are using only for a short time and what are we gaining from these four hours that is what you have to think again i i, I will tell you this elect in this uh, especially for this paper and also when you are looking at macro level this electrical engineering the energy side and the economics they are all mixed so you have to think in that context you have to consider about the economics everywhere. So here is the one thing that you can say. Sri Lanka is using so much of electricity in these three hours. And electricity we say we use for gainful economic activities. Now what are the gainful economic activities that we are doing in these three hours? Of course the run de pair is one thing. Other than that maybe there may be other economy. Of course the commercial work is going on in some shopping complexes are open that is true but still are we doing night shopping are we into so much of night shopping compared to other countries i don't think so so most of this is we are using in domestic switch lighting tv and air conditioning so what is the economic gain that we gain so that is a something but someone would say yes but we are getting a good physical quality or a comfort level and that is a developing uh, uh, that is an aspiration of a developing nation to increase their comfort level their physical qualities of life that is increased because we will watch tv 
we will have an air conditioned room in the heat in the heat that we had about two or three months ago of course having an air conditioned was a comfort so that is another extreme <coughs> that is why i said there are no exact answers it is all approximations and comparisons pros and cons you are uh, problems you are questions in the paper because they are engineering day to day macro level questions so they will also not have definite answers is it correct to put on your air conditioner in the afternoon no you will not get such questions because those are not there, there are no hard and fast answers for them you have to weigh what do you think and of course as engineers then we know that we will have to do a calculation for the economics of that for the finances of that and also for the social part of that even even though we cannot quantify it at least a qualitative assessment if you are going to analyze that so that is the way we have to think there are no hard and fast so this uh, our uh, demand curve the load pattern is important because it is more skewed to the domestic usage and it is not flat our plant factor this our capacity factor which you have heard is in the range of 60 percent that means if the total capacity was the total energy that could have been uh, utilized by the machines running 100 uh, percent was divided by the total energy or if you had a line going through this maximum amount that area covered by that, by that straight line and the area covered by this graph is around uh, the division is about 60 percent so that is a low figure relatively if it was around 70 percent or 75 percent of course they say that it's a good figure but on the other hand if cb is selling this uh, generated electricity at a loss of course this may be a better figure that is once again something that we will come into this talk. so these are the daily load curves of the maximum day of the respective years from 2007 to 2014 sorry i could not put in the 2015 figures you would see the same it's the same pattern starting from the morning peak then the day flat and the evening peak of course what we saw was in the last uh, this year first quarter was that from february march and early april this day peak came very close to the this peak so that is the first time in sri lanka's history that something the curves got so flat that was due to the heat wave i think more than the, anything more than any production or be people getting into more industries or anything it's the air conditioning load mostly <clears throat> but anyway that that occurrence is there so air conditioning is becoming a very important aspect in electricity demand like heat uh, heating is in other countries in other countries heating is a very important aspect in uh, countries where you have a cold climate and therefore when you are planning you have to do the seasonal changes in sri lanka it is less but now maybe we will have to think about that also this is the historical development of the electricity sector i will not go into that but uh, when you have time i think this will be available here with isl so you can go in we started in 1984 then there was the thermals and then electricity was put up in the mid 30s in 1950s the first hydropower plant the lakshapana was put up and then the lakshapana uh, the kaladi river uh, power stations were developed then we came to uh, the thermals with the uh, first uh, some Calidity is a steam plants coming in the 1960s and Ceylon Electricity Board replaced the government uh, department of electrical undertaking in 1969. In the mid 70s, the first Mahavali came and under the long Mahavali project, the 30 year project. And uh, in 1984, the first power station under the Mahavali project, accelerated Mahavali project came in 1984. You would know the accelerated Mahavali project is, of course, the civil engineers here would know. Uh, the Mahavali uh, development plan was earlier planned for a 30 year period and Ukwil and Bovathanna came at the first part and that plan was more agriculture oriented and the power output was less but with the change of policies so you see these electricity sectors like any other industry but electricity sector like any other aspect of engineering like any other industry the electricity industry is very much related to the country's economics and policies 
but electricity is very much related maybe more than others with the change of the government's thinking of the policies the, of the open economic concepts they thought that the power demand would increase and therefore the power aspects of the accelerated Mahavali program was increased the contributions that is how about 500 odd uh, megawatts came from the Mahavalis in the 1990s the late 90s the reform we would know the restructuring of the power sector that is from the from government utilities from the government owned undertakings the input of the, or the share of private parties came the first IP pi, private power plant came into being in 1996 in 2011 the first coal power plant was inaugurated and by 2014 it was uh, in the, oh, the whole 900 megawatts gross was uh, installed completed so that is basically the history you should have some awareness of history but of course not the not to be thorough with it this is the hydrothermal historical share you would see even in 1994 Sri, Sri Lanka's electricity requirements were supplied by uh, hydropower almost 100 percent but after that it has been coming down because we have been utilizing our hydro resources but maybe with wind coming into play a big role in the future this will catch up a little of course there are plans that we would be going back to the 1994 levels maybe 100 percent renewable i don't know they, 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 there are there are thinking there are uh, focus on that way and there there are people or policy makers who say that that is what we will be doing i don't know it could be when and how is the issue now i will turn from that we have been talking about the importance of the knowing the figures at what level whether it is grams kilograms megawatts so as i said sri lanka's power demand is in megawatts 3000 2000 range it's not in gigawatts if it was in gigawatts one two three that is what and sri lanka's energy generation was in the 10,000, 11,000 gigawatt hour range. Our per capita consumption was somewhere around 500 kilowatt hours. So th that is, and our losses, transmission and loss, distribution losses was 10%. World's best is in Korea, it is about 5%. Even better than European or US uh, utilities. Japan and Korea have the best. So they are island nations, heavily populated. And so it is something we can aspire to be. But we have come down from 20 to 10 those are the things the, that is what i've been thinking about and then the share of, or the contribution from different sources uh, how coal has come to a, uh, play an important role and also the history now when we are talking about a power sector of course in any sector you have to understand what are the in institutions involved the policy maker is the ministry of power and renewable energy it represents basically the owner the owner of the country it's the public the public elects uh, government and the government is represented by the minister or the ministry so that is the policy maker CEB is a government owned board uh, it is a transmission monopoly and hydrothermal distribution is also basically distribution is also basically a CEB monopoly plus leco which is also a sort of a subsidiary of CEB it being a government subsidiary anyway leco's shares are owned by CEB and uh, UDA and other government agencies as I said so CEB has the transmission monopoly transmission is basically at high voltage levels bringing generation to distribution levels uh, there are also government owned companies CEB sub government or CEB subsidiaries in the sector LECO and LTA LECO is a licensee because it has the license to distribute like uh, CEB in a uh, given area uh, to customers Lanka Transformers is not a licensee, but it has licenses through its subsidiaries for generation because it's involved in business in generation as well as in projects and project execution like that. What we call IPPs are thermal power plants which are under given contracts. So that is their contracts are unique. You would have heard there are power plants like AES Calditis, of course, now the owning company has changed. Then there is the ACE ability here. Heladanami, different names, Asia Power, but because these are have different contracts, individual unique contract with CEB based on their investment, type of technology, and 
those things and all these contracts generally for this private power has been in the take or pay type contracts where their capital investment and the return is assured but so uh, the, so the basic is that uh, the agreement with them is that there is no profit for them for energy they have to assure the capacity if you have 100 megawatts committed you have to assure 100 megawatts throughout the time that it is in contract for that they will be paid their investment plus a return if on CB's request they make in, a, in energy any any energy that will be a pass through there is a, a great efficiency and for the amount of energy generated they will be paid the full cost based on the uh, <coughs> in, uh, invoices so they, they cannot make a profit on energy it's just something that you may want to remember it's like you know hiring a vehicle for the whole month or something like that if it runs you will pay diesel but you, you are sort of hiring it leasing it out so lease cost so something like that there are other private generators that is supplying non-conventional renewable energy that is renewable energy, like the mini hydro wind that sector so that is below 10 megawatts they have a similar uh, agreement what is called the standard power purchase agreement all the i won't say all the mini uh, sppas are the same but they have a standard depending on the year they have they are connected or depending on the technology now that uh, type of uh, tariff the uh, uh, mini hydro or the ncre uh, generators are signing is called the technology specific cost reflective tariff so based on their technologies based on the investment cost a specific tariff is there so that tariff is common to all high, uh, uh, mini hydro uh, sorry all the ncres of that technology connecting in that tier so though that is changed every year depending on the price variations then there is the sri lanka sustainable energy authority because that is also a separate agency you know that and its importance is that to uh, carry out any uh, generation or any utilization of a uh, indigenous uh, renewable resource you have to get the approval and the license of the slsc and they also have the they they are a develop, they are a promoter of renewable energy and also they can sort of acquire land if necessary for these uh, renewable generation projects even ceb uh, sort of has to get a approval when it's developing renewable resources then of course there is pucsl the public utilities commission which is the regulator so there is the policy maker i don't know whether i have that uh, no okay it's better so here is it is it is in from the regu regulatory view or a legal view there are three acts mainly that is the sri lanka electricity act number 20 of 2009 so here when we are thinking about this uh, uh, these uh, sectors or anything you have to understand that when you take off a legal basis when you are interacting with somebody there should be a legal basis even at our home uh, if you have a family there is a legal basis that first is the marriage ordinance it is starting starting from there then there is the inheritance laws but starting then there are the customs especially when it's a social matter there are the laws as well as the customs but and who are the players in the family maybe the husband and wife and the children and of course the parents in laws or parents like that the relatives the circle gets widened in if you take a family in a social and their actions are regulated first by laws of course and then also the customs the social customs but here when you take a sector in the in an economy or a country it is governed by laws when there are players how they interact with each other is governed by law if you take cricket of course there are the players there are the umpires there are and then the each team there are two teams in if you take a match now there are so many other there is umpires there are the referees there is the third umpire there are the commentators spectators all those but all of them are governed by laws there are the national laws icc's laws cricketing laws like that similar way in the power industry the main acts for the players to interact is the sri lanka electricity act 
electricity x defines how this electricity business can be done in sri lanka if you want to even if if you take the legal uh, meaning by itself even if you generate at your home using a some device that you have made yourself maybe using some kerosene still you have to get a license from the uh, regulator of course it is not regulated to that extent but according to the act it is so so that is how the regulation that powers are given in the sri lanka electricity act number 20 of 2009 the previous act was electricity act number 50 of na number 17 of no i'm sure not sure the, uh, the electricity act in 1950 that was completely replaced by the electricity act number 20 of 2009 and it was amended in 2013 it sets out completely how the electricity act industry is to be regulated who is the regulator how is the regu is regulating who is going to have the license how the license would be given all that then there is the PUCSL Act number 35 of 2002 because PUCSL is the regulator public utilities commission of Sri Lanka is the regulator for utilities in Sri Lanka utility services in Sri Lanka except telecom because telecom when PUCSL was established there was a regulator already there for telecom the concept at the time of uh, the TRC coming in that is late 90s the telecom was the sort of the first industry to be deregulated where a regulator or restructured and the first maybe the first regulator in such an industry and at that time a specific regulator for the telecom industry was put up but in 2002 2004 when the this restructuring uh, program was at its peak the public utilities commission act was passed and it was uh, defined in such a way that all the utilities will be regulated power petroleum water lubrication everything will be regulated by the PUCS the PUCSL act is defined in such a way that the PUCSL act says only who is in the commission and how the commissioners are appointed how they are taken off all that and it says that if any act uh, the powers to regulate to the commission is empowered by the industry act so the 2009 electricity act said that this this and this and the regulator is the PUCSL appointed as by the PUCSL act so that is how the link comes if the water sector is to be regulated next time there will be a act on water regulation and that act will say okay the our regulator would be the PUCA public utilities commission as of now the PUCSL is regulating the electricity industry and the lubrication industry in Sri Lanka the policy maker of course is the ministry of power and energy on behalf of the government Transmission license in Sri Lanka there is only one according to the Electricity Act and it says the CEB is the transmission licensee. Generation license, CEB has generation license, IPPs and the SPPAs. All persons who are supplying electricity to uh, CEB or the transmission licensee have generation licenses. In distribution there are five licenses. CEB has been issued four licenses for four divisions or four areas that CEB is covering and separate licenses for those division 1, division 2, division 3, division 4 and LECO. So those are the licenses. So these are the main players in the sector. There is the policy maker at one day, there is the government and then there is the regulator at this end. The regulator is the techno-economic regulator. So it can regulate technical part that is the safety part and the technical part of it as well as the economic part that is the tariff both of these parts the PUCSL has the power to regulate PUCSL is a techno economic regulator of the industry and CB's licenses li uh, according to that CB has been given the distribution for licenses and the generation license for the for 15 years and the transmission license so after 2025 maybe act is open so then there may be changes. Previously, if only if you are selling in to somebody that you needed to get, actually you cannot generate and sell to anybody in Sri Lanka. 
because the only person who can purchase electricity is the transmission license in Sri Lanka. That is definite. So, you cannot generate and sell to anybody. That you cannot. But even to have, because the act, if you read carefully, you will see that for any generation of power to use a generation facility, you need a license. But I don't know after the amendments or recently, maybe the PUCSL have given, because PUCSL can give uh, exemptions. So, it may now have given exemption for anybody who is using for its own an exemption may be may have been given or you can ask I, I think that was what the thinking was that was what they were aiming but I am not sure whether it was done or not that is the logical thing if it is below something or if you are using for yourself that is okay but anyway you cannot sell nobody can sell electricity in Sri Lanka except to the transmission licensee because that is how the electricity industry is structured the pricing and everything is done in that way so that only the transmission licensee can uh, purchase electricity from a generator. This is the basic uh, diagram of the single line diagram of the power transmission network. I am showing you again one for you to get a sort of understanding. Of course, I know that uh, you may have all gone through this, You most of you know this, but just to get an understanding because any, any industry you are trying to understand, you should get a, some insight of where it is starting, where it is ending, where is the production, where is the consumption, where is the product, uh, sort of transportation. So that is basically for engineering, we need a start and an end. So in that way, analyze or have, keep in your mind the electrical industry also. It is starting from generation, so that is where the production is, then it is transported through the highways, then through tributary low or lower grade higher roads and then through the by roads to the customers that is how you can remember electricity also so these are the generators we have placed g that is it can be hydro or thermal some would be connected to the 132 network some would be connected to the 220 kv network so 220 kv in sri lanka the transmitting voltages there are two 132 kilo volts and 220 kilo volts 220 kv you may say that it is the uh, highways or the expressways of Sri Lanka of the transmission network because the 220 kvs network there are no not many nodes and also it is not directly generally connected to the uh, loads it is through the 132 kv network that it is connected it may change in the future but anyway there is the 220 grid uh, 220 lines and there are also 132 lines so here this is coming down to 132 but this is only an example that there may be 132 kv uh, this is only 132 kv so these are 220 lines 132 lines and this is coming now to a grid substation what we call a grid substation a grid substation is generally has uh, brings down the voltage to a lower voltage from a transmission voltage so here in this example it is 132 to 33. Of course, there are some grid substations, especially in Colombo, where it is brought down from 132 to 11, because 11 is the medium voltage uh, that is used. So, from 33 kV, you have feeders going to a few feeders going from uh, distribution, sorry, grid substation to a primary substation. So, in the primary substation, you may bring it down to another medium voltage distribution level of 11 kV. LECO does its uh, medium voltage distribution in 11 kV. CB does it in 33 kV. And from here it is supplied to LECO. But if you take this distribution substation, even though it is called distribution substation, it may be a pole mounted transformer which you see near your home or along the road. So from a grid substation, this is brought down to 33 kV. And from 33 kV feeders or trans, uh, distribution lines are coming here and from 33 to from 33 to 400 volts it is brought down and to re your residential customers it may be given. So that is the basic uh, conventional electricity supply starting from generation high voltage 220 or 132 then it is transmitted if it is this is in somewhere in 
central province of Sri Lanka from Koth Malay or Victoria. It will come down to somewhere like Biagama or Pandipitiya and will be brought down to 33 kb somewhere close to your Nugegoda primary or Udhamula primary or somewhere or a distribution transfer station that is a transformer near your home pole mounted 33 to 400 or oh, at 33 level there are bulk customers of course many of you would be bus bulk customers who are getting your electricity at bulk level so that is so if you think about uh, in the uh, sort of a analogy this is you know your whatever you are rice so dal lo, paripo, whatever is being produced here and it is transported in heavy loads in heavy vehicles at in large volumes very fast because one of the reasons why the high we are using transmission is that your transmission is for a long uh, lines and for long lines uh, to negate the drop due to the losses due to current the i squared r loss or the uh, copper loss we bring, bring up the voltage then there is less current for the same energy so in that highways you transport it and this may be uh, next level of uh, bulk shops or whatever and these are the toga kades of the next level and the distribution transformer would be the retail stores like that that is the network the sort of the transport network of the electricity but that is the conventional but since the last 10 or 15 years there is a new kid on the block that is the renewable energy or the non-conventional renewable energy because they are scattered not at one place and because they are then connected to the 33 kv network that is the at the medium voltage level and they come they do not go through the transmission network they supply directly so so far the electrical industry and the technologies has been even protection and all those settings have been sort of a radial networks or a grid transmission generation transmitted uh, medium voltage distribution but here generation is coming very close to the customers from this 33 kv this may be connected directly to the this 33 kv node in up country uh, these, these are connected to the same 33 kv uh, network and it goes to without going through the transmission network to the customers it has its pros and cons to say an example a pro is that a good thing is that then you don't need to bring electricity from far then the losses are less but on the other hand when it is raining right throughout the day and when the load in this the substation is very low then what is generated from 33 kV has to be gone transported through the transmission network with much losses to other places so that has its problems so those are the two different things of course I will not go through the Mahavali and Laksapana complex diagrams if they are available just to show you the present transmission network this is not very clear but once again uh, what I would want you to understand is that what is in purple or pink what do you see purple is the 220 kV network the present 220 kV network you would see that the whole uh, the squares are the grid substations and the what is circles are the power stations i don't know whether you see it so well the hydro power stations are the circles with a solid half and an empty half anyway what is in purple is the 220 kv network and 132 kv network is in green one thing you would say is that there is the concentration of power plants or in this area that of course in the central area that of course we will know because the hydro power plants are located there then there is a concentration of grid substations in this area and down here in this area why is that because most of the, that that is where the load is in, if you take sri lanka this area takes up the bulk of the about 62 so i think 75 northwestern province western province uh, southern province together takes about 60 percent of 65 i can't remember you can go through the, our data of the electricity demand and also i think the gross product 
domestic product of the country that is and also there is a much of the population the industry and commercial organizations are there and the 220 kv networks are basically what they are doing is connecting this um, making highways connecting the main center kotmale and biaga then also giving some you know uh, expressway for the current because it has to go right up to the north these areas it is giving a uh, 220 expressway from here and also you we know that the main power station is here in putla so this 220 network brings down 220 line brings down power from there to the west west coast and there is a missing 220 line which is uh, because this diagram is old from putlam to anuradhapur also so there is a 220 k kv ring at the moment so this is also collected at 220 k so that is basically the 220 network and the 132 network goes sort of a radial from the central area connected the west and to the other areas in radial so that is i will show you the plan one so this will have more rings later so this is basically the 220 and the 132 networks what you would see or you can gain from this is that the concentration of grid substations in the southern or the western uh, coasts of sri lanka because of the electricity demand generation technologies that we will touch on in 5 minutes time if you have any questions to now on the hydro turbines generation technologies this is once again just for your information you can uh, learn a lot from you you know internet and also if you so see these documents and all that what i am talking here is that what we have in sri lanka generation technologies there is of course hydro both in the power private and 
uh, CEB large, large in, in the sense to compare to Sri Lanka. And the, 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 that is something that we have to always think of in what context, because my personal experience is that when you are dealing with uh, persons or outsiders, you have to always think of context. My, I have a experience when I was thinking of uh, a Chinese developer when I was in a planning division, planning branch, who came to me and spoke to me about what are the projects available in hydro. I said, of course, we don't have large hydro anymore. We have only medium uh, hydro plants, medium level hydro plants. But he was talking about small hydro. So he was talking to me about 10 or 15 minutes. Of course, it, it, it was no, going nowhere because we cannot have unsolicited proposals. Of course, it was Chinese gentleman he from who had come uh, maybe around 2003 or 4 at that time. And after that only sometime went that I understood that he was referring by small hydropower to power plants of 50, 60, 70 megawatt size. To us, they were medium or large. For them, it was small. For them, the large were the 600 megawatt, 500 megawatt size. Because at that time, the ten go the what do you call it? The Chinese 2,000 or 3,000 megawatt hydropower plants was being built. So that is the context. So when we are talking about small or large, you have to think about the context also. And hydro turbines, uh, the the wind, wind of course, majority in the uh, private sector. CB has the pilot project which was done in Hambantota, and of course, CB is now uh, planning to do a 100 megawatt power plant in Mana area. Steam turbines, we have as of now in coal, steam turbines in uh, biomass power plants, in some biomass power plants, dendro. If you don't know the dendro, dendro, the word dendro means wood. Uh, dedicated wood that is uh, plants grown dedicatedly dedicated plants grown for a purpose maybe for power generation or for gasifying or some sort of a use if you get, get plants or wood from a forest directly for a power plant that will not that you cannot consider it as a renewable technology or a dendro power plant so we, you have to uh, identify with the difference uh, gas turbines in Sri Lanka, we are running on diesel and uh, combined cycle. Combined cycle is the gas turbine and a steam si si uh, turbine together. A gas turbine is uh, run on uh, basically in, again in Sri Lanka in diesel because we do not have gas. Or uh, one plant can run on uh, low sulfur furnace oil and the exhaust of the gas turbine which is which has a potential amount of energy is used to uh, heat water in a steam uh, cycle and that is used to uh, run a steam turbine so that is why we, we have in the combined cycle plant gas turbine and a steam turbine that if a, a gas turbine if you take only a gas turbine the efficiency is around 25 percent 28 maybe when you have a combined cycle that is with a steam turbine also incorporated into the uh, unit you have you can gain about a 45 percent efficiency of course unlike the gas turbine the investment for the steam turbine is relatively high in Sri Lanka we have the combined cycle plants running on diesel uh, NAFTA we use we can use NAFTA in the uh, CB's uh, combined cycle plant the Calitis combined cycle plant and also the Kerala Pitya Yugadharami power plant can run on furnace oil, but low sulfur furnace oil. Then, of, then diesel engine technology is used, especially in uh, private power plants, furnace oil, residual oil. There is a residual oil coming directly from the Sapugaskanda refinery. It is used in the Sapugaskanda power plant of CEB as well as uh, some pow private power plants. And so, solar photovoltaic is also there. Solar thermal may be coming up next. This is once again just indicative figures, some old figures I have got from the uh, generation plan. Don't take about those figures in the bottom, but what I would bring to your attention is the cost of production involves the capital cost as well as the operation cost. And when you are making an investment decision, you have to consider both 
the capital cost as well as the operation cost think it in like this, this way you want to purchase a diesel uh, a vehicle a car when you are going to purchase the car you have the option of buying a diesel car as well as a petrol car if when you are making that purchase you will think about the cost of the car the initial cost as well as its running cost and also your usage how much you will use it if you are you going to work every day in your car and you have to travel about 50 kilometers one way that is 100 kilometers both ways even though the diesel car has a incremental capital cost we know that its uh, operating cost is low so after uh, if you make some calculations we all know that after your usage when if at after some point the diesel car is profitable in the long term if, but if you are running it the, if your usage is high that is if you have a high usage relatively i'm talking in relative terms purchasing a diesel car is the more economical option but if you are using you have the office car to uh, travel but you use the your own car only to go to the market uh, once a month maybe and take your mother to the temple on the poor day and maybe during the holidays go on one trip that is all if so what will you do then most likely you will go for a petrol car even though its operating cost is higher because your usage the in the advantage or the profit from usage will not be enough to set off the high cost of the capital cost i think you understand all, all of you this diesel car petrol car thing similarly when we are making an investment decision in the in a, for a generator you have to think about its capital cost variable or the full o and m cost the fixed o and m that is the fixed o and m cost and also the variable costs so both these type of cost the capital cost and the variable cost and the running cost the running costs have the variable cost and the fixed cost o and the fixed o and m and the variable o and m and the fuel cost those are the running cost of the power plant and the running cost act, uh, happen every year the capital cost at the earliest so if, when you are making an economic decision or when you are making an option analysis you would make a uh, economic decision when you are making a price decision regarding the price or the electricity cost you will be making a financial decision then you will take in the low uh, the loans the interest into that of course the renewable plants do not have a full cost and you have to remember that when we are dispatching power plants in the system the accepted practice and now it is almost low because of the regulator is there The general principle is that you dispatch only based on variable costs because the capital cost is something that you have already incurred. It is a sunk cost. Once you have purchased the power plant, it is there. Or once you have signed the contract, it is there. The capital cost or the fixed cost, as we say, is there. It is. It, you have to pay the loan whether you run it or not. Then the power plants are decided dispatching which plant to run first which plant to be dispatched first is taken based on their variable cost the plant with the least cost is decided first the system control plant or branch will always have that list based on the full prices based on the uh, price con contracts which and the CEB's costs whether it is IPP or CEB whatever because depending on the technologies depending on the fuel different power plants have different running costs and it is based on that variable cost that the power plants will be dispatched and when we are making investment decisions also which power plant to be taken or which power plant to be put in the plan you have to consider both the capital costs as way and the variable costs both you cannot think of just one you would see that this is a typical this is a comparison uh, in the coal power plant when it is uh, 1900 
I'm just showing you the for a comparison. Kilowatt per kilowatt capital cost is around thousand nine hundred. The, the gas turbine is about one fourth of it, five hundred. And if you go to the operating cost, that is the generation cost, where the fuel costs and the all are taken, but here the capital cost is not there. I am showing you just to think of it. The coal three power plant, the capital cost is at a very high level, is 1,964. The gas turbine is 500, about one fourth of the capital cost. But in the operating cost, coal steam, when it is 5 US cents, the gas turbine would be 25 US cents, five times the operation cost. So that is the difference. If you if we if you go back to okay I you will see here this part this is the plant factor that is the usage this is the specific cost that specific cost has taken into account both the capital costs and the operating cost and the time value of money all of them have been considered then this these are the costs this once again just take the figures because these numbers have changed the actual numbers would have changed but not the uh, what do you call the line so you will see that when the usage is the plant factor is increasing the cost per kilowatt hour is coming down here it is something like that the gas turbines are somewhere here the coal power plants are here so that is the change because for high capital cost plants, if they are, if the fuel cost is low comparatively, then its specific cost is comes lower. If it is run more, you, you can get your return because you don't have the incremental cost that you have to use. You have to pay for such a plant is very low. So that is why we call the coal power plants which have a high capital cost but a lower uh, operation cost. Coal, nuclear maybe even uh, natural gas to some extent as base load power plants but gas turbines some peaking hydros they are called peak power plants because they can they have a lower especially gas turbines diesel engines they have a lower capital cost but a higher operation cost so if we take our uh, our load pattern of the daily load curve you would see that amount something below this is always there is this demand so this is a 300 maybe 2 out of 365 days there would be some de demand like that but this demand comes only for about 4 hours a day so you need a different type of a power plant for that period because if you buy a high capital cost power plant for all this time it is lying idle all this time then its capital cost will not be recovered by the fuel costs because it's not running so that is why we have we need a mix of power plants even though one would say coal is lower or diesel is lower or hydro is lower you need a mix depending on this load pattern and also the different fuels like that so i just wanted to show you the, the, that uh, you, you to get some understanding that just one type of a plant or a one fuel is you cannot handle in a country like ours because most of the fuels that we would be uh, importing or if we are using a technology other technology for the renewables most of the for the most of the renewables the capital cost we have to import the equipment once again there is an outlay even though there is a, a foreign currency outlay if even if the it's not uh, it's there is no full cost now coming to tariffs uh, again another issue in sri lanka different tariffs there are many different tariff categories in sri lanka of course, in a lot of countries there is, there is the domestic tariff, the general purpose tariff and it is below 42 and 
more than 42 kVA. As you, I think you all of you know that more than 42 kVA, you need to have time of use tariff. That is, depending, there are three tiers of tariff bands, and depending on the time, you are charged differently. At the peak time, you are charged higher. At the off-peak, you are charged less, and at the middle time, a middle amount. That is to encourage or discourage or to change this load curve. You would, I think, understand a little bit now, uh, based on our load curves, why we are charging like that. Previously, this time of day tariff was voluntary, but now, to all customers above 42 kVA, it is compulsory. And even for domestic tariff, we have a three-phase, uh, sorry, Domestic three-phase customers, CB or, or uh, Sri Lanka has a uh, time of use tariff. This was brought up specially to cater for uh, people who are having uh, electric cars. So that is something that you would uh, we th see in this policy issue. When uh, this uh, electric car phenomena came in, uh, CB and the electricity sector thought that, okay, this is something we have to get... Uh, used to and this is something that should be encouraged uh, considering the pollution levels and the efficiencies of the and the energy efficiencies of the country so therefore uh, at an attractive tariff because at that moment at that time what uh, repelled most of the people was the high tariff but if you compare even at that rate uh, i think uh, if you take only the operation cost uh, the fuel and electricity is still at 45 uh, uni, uh, rupees a unit I think it was profitable for a person if you just take the operation costs. But anyway, what CB wanted was uh, in consultation with the PUCSL, a time of use tariff was around so that during the off-peak hours, the, there is a lesser cost for the customer and they could charge the vehicle at that time and use it in the day. So that was the concept and that is why this uh, tariff was introduced, expecting that there was a big uh, uh, development of electric cars in the country. But as you know, there was a policy change at another part type, uh, I mean, not at this end, but at the other end. And now I don't think there are many customers for us of three phase. There are some, but not the expected amount. So that is how policy changes affects the industry. We all thought that it would be a good uh, way or good, uh, good result to the good effect to the electrical industry because that our peak, uh, bringing down the peak would be affected by it, but that has not happened so far. So these are the three major types of tariffs, domestic, general purpose and uh, industry. And of course the hotels and governments also, if you need to have, have a, the numbers, you should see the current tariffs which are in the websites. Of course you should know that there is a fixed charge and an energy charge once again in all these tariffs, fixed charge, energy charge and also there is a maximum demand charge which is another type of charge which I would not go into detail. Generally the fixed charge and the energy charge. Fixed charge is for the capital investment that is the basic. The energy charge is for the energy that you use. The fixed charge is there because you may you depending on the whether it is a 30 ampere connection or a 60 ampere connection the utility has contracted you is responsible to give you at any time that amount of energy even though you are not using it generally. That is why that fixed cost is there. The energy cost is the pass through of that energy charge. This is the cost of production and sales just to show you how in the last four years <coughs> in red is the average cost of production uh, per unit. This is in per unit per kilowatt hour. So for kilowatt hour sold the production cost is in the range of 20 plus in 2012. It has come down to 2000 in 2013 and again gone up to 2014 and come down in 2015. If you remember, so relatively it has come down and the price has sort of stayed in the same way and based on that there has been uh, the difference, profit or loss. Of course, with CB's uh, finances, whether to take, say it is profit or loss is an issue, but anyway, uh, Mainly this has been affected by the amount of hydro generation in the country. In 2013 and 15, there was a considerable 60% and almost 50% generation was from hydro. And by 2015, 35% of generation was from coal. 
and those are the two two things which has affected in bringing down the generate uh, the cost of production and and also in general uh, the compared to 2012 in 2015 the fuel costs have also come down but on the other other hand the onm cost uh, and the ancillary administrative costs that have gone up with the cost of living if you take uh, today's electricity cost actual costs and compare it in a relative way to some 10 years ago you would see that uh, it, it is even though it is it, it may have gone high up or even your electricity bill but from uh, from the bill you cannot say it itself because it is most of the time subsidized but in a relative term what we can see is that uh, relative to other costs uh, the electricity costs would have come down in uh, uh, from a total percentage level but because of the subsidies this cannot be shown as you would know that uh, domestic customers who are uh, using more than 180 are charged at 45 when the average uh, selling price is in the range of 20 to 50 so that you you would see that there are differences there but of course whether that is right or wrong is another issue these are things that i would like to point out so the future development uh, cb carries out uh, this is not a 15 year it is actually now for a 25 years the long term generation expansion plan and by law now this has to be carried out because the 2013 amendment to the electricity act says that the transmission licensee cannot purchase any power that is not in the uh, on generation plan but of course whether that is happening or that is another issue and uh, trans first uh, there is the generation development and the transmission development associated with the generation plan and the distribution plan is uh, at regional and provincial levels the plan generation uma oya hydropower 150 megawatts of course last one and a half years as you know there have been issues with the moya project broadlands project is uh, going on at two th uh, 2017 of course it will not come moragallo hydropower project there is again a small one the these are the uh, remaining hydropower plants of potentials in sri lanka trincomalee coal power plant this is a joint venture by cb and ntpc of course very recent in last two weeks you would have heard that there is a big question mark which has come up and of the base load of the large power plants this was the one in the pipeline that has come close almost close to realizing because tenders were about to be called and finances were about to be sought between the joint venture but as you, there has been we are uh, by the government there it is said that there is a decision to turn from coal to lng of course if that happens this will get delayed again and that is an issue in the sector mana 100 megawatts wind by cb that is uh, also in the feasibility has the feasibilities have been completed it's in the financing stage and feasibility studies have been carried out for advanced subcritical coal that is for higher efficient coal power plants uh, use of lng pump storage also nuclear planning at a very lower stage at a very initial stage just for your knowledge the transmission network you would see that there are 400 kv lines proposed this red one are 400 kv lines you would see uh, additional uh, lines this purple lines are the 220 kv networks by 2222 an additional number of uh, rings for the uh, sorry additional number of lines for the 132 as well as for the 220 networks is planned and also this is from the 2013 plan the current plan would be a little different from this because with the annual rolling plans depending on the circumstances these plans do change okay now we have come to an interesting and or an important part because this is where i think you should put your mind and argue because none of these uh, issues have clear answers i will start with uh, 
the economic part in this yeah you would know that uh, you have would have heard always that CEB is at loss petroleum corporation is at a loss what is this CEB produces electricity and sells it at different costs to different customers when the pricing is done it is expected that certain customers would subsidize the other customers but still sometimes this tariff is not made to make it balance and there is a part that it is expected the government would subsidize and this subsidy has to come in cash but the government cannot raise this cash and the CEB buys petrol oh sorry petroleum from petroleum corporation and CEB buys electricity from IPPs and when their bill comes the IPP has its own bill and that has two components as I would say the fixed cost that is for the capacity payment that is for the investment and the loans the power plant has taken and for the energy that is the second part so it's a two part tariff so it's a huge amount that has to be paid then the CEB's full bill has to be paid of course when you are trying to pay you know you have to when you are at also at home you will think who is to pay of course you will first pay the tele telephones I know all of you will pay the telephone bill next the water bill and next maybe the electricity bill but if you have borrowed something from your father or mother you will put it later if you don't have it, any money like that CB will also think who is to pay of course CB will pay its employees the salary like you would do bring uh, rations for your home for your uh, daughter or your family like that CB would first pay its salaries sometimes it may not even and then it will take who is to pay the outsiders of course IPPs are there with IPPs there are legal contracts if you don't pay there is a sovereign guarantee for the government the government is bound to pay it anyway if CB do not pay the government will have to pay and if there is a failure it will go most of them are foreign investors and CB has legal contracts with them and if we do not pay there is interest component added to it and also they they may go to courts and they may stop even supply energy so CB will pay first the IPPs and even on the IPPs sometimes which have a lesser uh, interest higher interest are paid first maybe the others are next then you come to the petroleum we don't have the money to pay whole, the whole thing to the petroleum we will pay a part because CB does not have money because petroleum is like your relative no it's in the government maybe in the same ministry and uh, petroleum will not you know they will not come barging in here of course the petroleum corporation will chairman will issue statements the minister will scold us but whatever it is the same government or same thing so what happens cb is in debt to uh, petroleum and also cb may not have had enough money to pay those ipps also for that cb borrows from the people's bank uh, and now there is cb's uh, overdraft it is increasing so cb borrows from the people's bank and pays to uh, the IPPs and also to petroleum part and petroleum has to raise the next LC to pay for the next uh, petroleum needed for CEB maybe CEB and also for the country and for that they do not have enough money because CEB has not paid so they will go and borrow from the bank of zero so their overdraft is also increased and they will bring electricity that will be generated and CEB will again uh, pay at a lower cost at a cost lower than generation and once again some more will be added to CEB's debt to people's bank the overdraft will go out again the debt to petroleum corporation will some more increase and again petroleum's debt to bank of Ceylon will and fortunately CEB is borrowing from people's bank petroleum corporation I think is borrowing from bank of Ceylon so th that is balanced so that is how this snake is done so that is this this uh, circle vicious circle is there and it uh, of course it has uh, it was very vicious about three or four years ago about five years ago when the whole thing was run on fuel and when the fuel prices were really hitting us but things have eased definitely by now that you have to understand CEB's overdraft has come down of course CEB is not paying its long term loans as of now only from now year, this year it's going to pay for a whole 10 years or 15 years CEB has not paid its loans to the treasury so that is again some people the treasury has subsidized the electricity customers but treasury means the whole country 
is subsidizing the electricity customers. The people at that time, maybe about 85% of the people were subsidized by the whole 100% of the country. Even today, when we say you subsidize, somebody else is paying. We have to understand that. So that vicious circle is there. But on the other hand, that vicious circle was there because some people were subsidized. Electricity was sold at below cost. Why? Some might say because the politicians don't like to lose elections. Maybe that is one reason. But on the other hand, there is accepted policy in economics and especially in social economics that the people at the lowest strung of the economy should be supported. Whether it's industry, whether it's in commerce, that is the whether you are doing your own work, uh, what we call the uh, small and medium industries, the SMEs, or the self in, uh, businessmen, the small businessmen, or what I mean by small business is the Bulat Vitakadi in the Bulat, or the person who is running a salon by himself, or a poor customer, the Samurti customers. Can, can or they, should they be made to pay the whole thermal bill? There is a big argument coming from some other policy, not policy or policy makers or some uh, people that the resources, the hydropower is, of this country, the energy coming from hydropower is a right of all the people of the country. So everybody should be given that power at that cost. So that everybody has that right. The other thermal higher cost should be give, given to the people who are using more than that. There is one argument put uh, why the below 60 percent, 60 units people are having such a low two, 2 rupees and 50 cents when somebody else is at 45 units is pay, sorry, 100, more than 180 units is paying at 45 rupees. In Sri Lanka, you know domestic customers, some are paying at 45 rupees, some are paying at 250. Why? Is it correct? I don't know. That is a policy. So these things affect the electricity industry. And these economics, as you were asking about the uh, solar, of course, solar uh, solar power does not have a full cost. That itself is an advantage. And the, uh, if it replaces a full during the daytime when it is running, yes, definitely it is an advantage. Eco economically, it could be an advantage. So our strain on foreign exchange will be less. But there is a hidden part to that also. Because all this pricing structure approved by the PUCSL was made in such a way, I, was, I didn't explain you how the tariff is made, but it anyway is made that finally the revenue requirements of the CEB is met by either from the uh, recovery from the customers plus any subsidy from government. So, in those assumptions, there is a certain amount of energy that you are supposed to be sold to customers who are more paying more than, uh, using more than 180 units. So they are paying at 45 rupees. So they are supposed to subsidize those customers who are using below. But once you have the solar power, the solar net metering, those customers, now there are about, I think, 20 megawatts of solar power in the country. Uh, if I, I don't remember the number of customers, there is net, what I mean by net metering is that you have your solar power uh, generator on the roof and you can you supply electricity when you are not using to the grid. Of course, you have to have certain uh, agreements and some certain technology meters installed like that. And for that uh, bill, you are billed only for your net consumption. If you have imported, you are billed. If you have exported, it is collected. And your net is always, I think, uh, I'm not sure, for about 10 years you can hold that, or one year, I'm not sure, you can hold that uh, your exports and imports net will be calculated. So most, almost all the people who have uh, fixed on the solar rooftop are now on a almost zero bill. And it is economical if you financially calculate, uh, on the face of it, it, it is financially viable only if you are use have some a bill about 7500 or 10000 in the present uh, tariffs and all those people were paying or supposed were supposed to pay at 45 rupees now they are not paying most of the time a cent and the pricing policy had that what that they some customers were supposed to uh, subsidize those about uh, 
I think about 200, 2 million customers, I am not sure, it's in the billions, who are using below 60 units. And who is now, their consumption is not subsidized. It is not paid by some, anybody. So it is going into the uh, books of CEB as a loss and it will be transferred into the government's losses because that subsidy, as I showed you somewhere, even it is C those it is CEB's losses, it will be in either in an overdraft of CEB, so that is in the people's bank or as a loan or a loss to or unpaid loan or a debt to CPC or a debt to an IPP in the country's losses. So that is the negative aspect of it because the policies, the, the, the encouragement of renewable is a government policy that is in conflict with the pricing policy. That is the issue. That is the negative part. And there is an, another negative part of it is that the solar power is uh, generating only in the daytime. But during the peak time, those customers are between 6.30 and 9.30, those customers are not uh, generating any electricity, sorry, those uh, net metering customers. But they are drawing most of the time from the system and they are not paying anything because they have supplied energy only during the daytime. And during the daytime, of course, there is a support to the system from them, but not as much as the cost or the strain on the system when they are drawing from the system during the peak time. So that is again there is a conflict. So those two are the negative points from the solar net metering onto the system, to the, in the present context. If the prices change, if the uh, structures change, of course it will be different. And the delays in implementation of power projects was one of the major issues. Always when the power project, you should, you would know that it is a long process for a coal power plant to come up. Sri Lanka's first coal power plant was thought about in 1981. I, I myself looked into it. It was in the generation plan in 1982 for the first time. And it was in 2000, and it was supposed to come in 1989 or 90, the first plant. It came about in 2011. So, 21 years of delay. That is specifically. But generally, it says that around 8 years, 4 years for initial studies, financing, feasibility studies and 4 years construction. That is a conventional. Of course, both of these can be brought down maybe 6 years from a greenfield as one would say to a construction. Even a liquid natural gas LNG plant, it could be nuclear plant, it will be 10 years or 12 years. Because, and in the, today's world, it is more because we all have the NIMBY syndrome in all countries. Not in my backyard. We don't like, we want development, but we don't want any happening in my backyard. That is typical, as uh, I think all, all of you, I think would have experienced it for you. When you are trying to build a bridge, when you are trying to build a road, when you are trying to put up a factory, when you are trying to put up a power plant, it's true. I myself have voiced concern for the wildlife department coming to closer to my house. I have signed petitions, but on the other hand, I have gone and spoken, fought with villagers to put up power stations. That is the way the world is coming because the world sort of has developed. The people's rights have come up. People's understanding of rights and also the part played by non-governmental organizations, maybe for the good of it, maybe for the bad of it, has become very strong. What is called the civil society has gained a lot of power, maybe more than the bureaucrats. So now it's very difficult to make a development. So that is why implementation of power projects, once delayed, takes a whole lot of time. That is why the professionals and within CB maybe people who understand are very concerned of the government's reason if they have taken, taken a decision from LNG to from coal to LNG that uh, even two power projects which were sort of in the power pipeline that is in Trincomalee, the joint venture and there was also going to be a proposal for a Japanese funded power plant both the government was thinking or has taken decision or is thinking in the line of converting or going for LNG instead of coal. So that would have economic repercussions as well as starting again, restarting. So once you delay a project, what happens is even though you delay that project, the demand would come. Of course, the demand would may not be the same as planned because the economic development is not as planned. When you are planning, you have to do the plan according to the projected economic development. And always, if you go through the uh, pro plans, the official plans, the government plans, there is a rosy picture. The economy is supposed to develop. So the planners in government entities have to plan according to that. 
Otherwise, they will be anti government. Fortunately, these things get delayed. Because of that, there is no oversupply. But on the other hand, once you get delayed, especially things like coal project, and when that get delayed in this window, there is a demand in that you have to fill in the short term. What happens? You get in power plants that are that you can implement in short term. Basically, four power plants, four five power plants, low capital cost, high full cost plants. So that is where from 1992 up to 2010, with the whole country suffered because with the delay of base load power plant, when we had the demand for a base load power plant, we did not have one. We because it was getting delayed, we were putting up small small full power plants, oil power plants, and that cost us. So that uh, could happen once again if you delay in power plants. Of course, high cost of production was a very big issue in the last 10 to 15 years. It is relatively low today, but it will always be relatively high compared with most of the other countries because we are a full importing country. 100% of the uh, petroleum fuels plus coal we have to import. Of course, if we hit the gas or the petroleum deposits, it's another story. But they still would be what the what we hear is not sufficient, even if though we have one. And if LNG replaces coal, of course, the ex this expected relative decrease in coal will also not happen in the electricity cost. It will be because if you take uh, the world uh, scenario, because of the climate change issue, you don't know that climate change is a phenomena that has been scientifically accepted, which says that due to uh, climate change, emission of climate, uh, certain six gases, the atmospheric temperature is, has gone up by almost two degrees. And because of that, there is a climate change and the sea level is rising. Carbon dioxide is a main reason and coal is one of the major uh, carbon dioxide emitters. And the world in 1990 uh, with the, uh, the Kyoto Agreement, with the UNFCC agreement in 1990, agreed to limit carbon, uh, the agreed to limit climate change due to uh, this emission of gases. But uh, and in 1990s there was the Kyoto Agreement, and once again there the the principle was that the world, the majority of emission has been done by the uh, developed world. Therefore, they will have limits to their uh, emissions, but the developing world will not have emissions, but they will be encouraged and financed to have better technologies. That was the understanding and the principle. And the recent Paris Agreement on Climate Change has made it that everybody, whether you are in the third world or in the first world, should do some reduction, should have some commitment, but that does not in any way uh, buy you from having coal plants or emitting carbon dioxide because that is not practical. If you go through the power plants of India or uh, China or even United States, you would see that they have coal power plants coming up, but they may have reduced the number of coal power plants that were they were supposed to come up. They would have <coughs> increased the renewables. But Sri Lanka was a 100% renewable. When they were using coal power, we were using renewable. So therefore, should not come to us. Because the cost co in co cost comparisons, coal is still the cheapest uh, fuel available if you compare the imports. The LNG costs have come down. But still, coal is a cheap option. So that is so in order to avoid this, uh, there is about, I think, 30 or 300 million, uh, sorry, I will not say figures offhand, but if you take the number of power plants coming up in China, what is planned for a 30 year period in uh, Sri Lanka's power plants, in the last power plant was to come up in China in one year, sorry, in India in one year, in coal plants they may have reduced by 10%. But we are trying to be sort of very, very, you know, philosophical or very meritorious by trying to bring good to the world by avoiding coal plants because then our emissions will come down. 
but will it affect how much will it affect to bring down the world uh, temperature atmospheric temperature we have to be practical in these things and we are doing a huge lot amount of renewables maybe more commitments to renewables in would be our commitment instead of sacrificing this economics to our people because that will definitely increase the cost of production and the electricity prices to the people or the economic crisis out of that the financial losses i told you the policy changes the very recent when because policy changes in the electricity sector if if you change the uh, duty structure of tobacco it's hit tomorrow if tonight you decide to put up cigarettes by 20 it's hit tomorrow but if you decide to convert coal to lng today that will be felt in 10 years time so the people taking the decision may not be there and people who are agreeing with that may also not be there and people who are executing at likes cast will also may be retired it is some completely a different set of people who would be affected so it's very easy to do these changes Uh, policy changes but the effects are very large and long term conflicting policies i told you about the tariff and net metering then the climate change commitments it's a global issue for which we are trying to sacrifice the whole economics to solve of course we must do our part but let others the responsible people also do their part integration of intermittent renewables which has been uh, talked very much i think Uh, is another issue i will come into that the environmental and social issues in site locations i told you we have very big issue that is true for all projects all infrastructure projects coming up where the environmental concerns have become very powerful and sometimes may not be practical in sri lanka now this is a personal opinion of mine we have doing during project implementation stages or at project planning levels would have been incurred if there are eia uh, environmental impact assessments and after that the eia reports and huge amount of conditions are laid out in those EIA, and during the eia reports you go into such a detail to check about those flora and fauna about this plant this uh, animal or this it is true i am not saying that they are wrong but you go into such a decision and those all those uh, projects gets delayed after that but once those eias are approved with all those conditions see about 4 or 5 years later who is interested in that? nobody we have so much of strict laws in the country regulating environment but are they implemented only at a level of start but not at operating level you go and check how many polluting industries are there they are not checked but if you want to put up a new industry but it would be better for a country now again once again this is something related to power sector also to have a more lenient set of rules or regulations but to impose them very thorough then you would have a smooth implementation but regulation at operating level laws so those are the things affecting this affected the upper kotmali this affected i think uh, uh, at presently umawe or odlands that is from the power side and we all know that even the airport harbor road projects everything gets affected by this it is not specific to sri lanka most of the countries this is happening and the difficulty in implementing tariff and the poor public image of cb there is also issue in the power sector even though it may be a issue to cb but as cb is the major player in the utility involvement of private investment now this is something again an issue uh, finding required capital this is again linked that is who should invest in the sector government or private if the government invests the issue is some people say that if the government is invest capital government has only a limited amount of fund availability so that fund is can be utilized for a sector because power can be generated and sold you can earn from that but health and education you cannot earn so whatever funds are available should be utilized for them but for the part uh, where uh, gener- uh, cash can be generated let private parties come because they are they will not come for education the a private party will not come and put up a math. central college in your area no as well. to teach you a kids free that will not happen but the funding from the adb may be utilized for that 
from the world bank may be utilized for that for power generation we will get a private generator in so that is the one side of it but the other side is when the private generator is coming the capital cost the interest are charged at high rates depending on the country's stability country's uh, security risk and the country's financial rates all those there are high interest you have to pay and also power is a very important element of the country's uh, energy security as well as general day to day operations and on that are you going to be fully dependent on the private sector and especially when the investors are from most of the times other countries because these large thermal plants a local investor can not alone come with the expertise in financing as well as the technology it is almost all our thermal uh, investments have been by outside people and also the profit is taken out from you in foreign currency and you become dependent on them and the security of the state may be at stake those things are there and also with them as i said depending on the financial situation you know delaying payments those things that cannot be done so those are the two sides finding capital soft loans and ipos another key issue is deregulation or the re sector restructuring so that is also uh, the next step now there is a single monopoly for transmission several ipps but uh, what is operated in sri lanka what is called the system is is the single buyer model that is purchasing electricity is only one person who can purchase electricity for sale sale per, uh, from a generator single buyer from that is the transmission license the transmission license is the only person who can purchase electricity from a generator that is the model operated in sri lanka so there is a virtual monopoly in transmission and but the distribution is not monopolized but so far cb and leco are the only people and the, previously there were there was going to be many companies these distribution licenses were going to be companies in the ref, uh, power sector reforms that was envisaged uh, in the early 2000s but that was stopped as a government policy but the government policy may be changing of course the world trends was there by early 2004 full privatization full open market competition anybody can generate anybody can sell anybody can transmit anybody can use they such power, uh, markets are also there and different levels in india also there is a uh, quite a lot of deregulation done but in some countries this has coming back in a cycle so what is happening will it be good what are the pros and cons of uh, privatizing or having different companies for distribution for transmission or is it good to have the same company would you continue to have the same ill faith and same fight with the ceb or would have new entities what is better what are the pros and cons of that those are the things that you might want to think about the renewable energy integration of course has its uh, own merits and demerits this has been talked about again like for solar i said the main advantage of renewable energy is that the full cost element is almost zero so that when you take thermals uh, the fuel has to be imported and the operating cost fuel charge has to be paid but for the renewables uh, it is not so the problem with most of the non conventional renewables is it, that is wind mini hydro solar and some others is its intermittency that is you cannot the conventional power systems in power networks the operators could ask the power plant to increase or decrease depending on the demand but here when you have intermittent power intermittent sources when the wind is changing when the solar pattern is changing especially the wind even in solar there are changes when there is a cloud cover in, even though we do not think unlike in deserts where in other countries we you have very large solar plants sri lanka there are there is cloud cover and if a cloud goes on your solar power there is a change in your pattern and that change has to be accommodated by some other power plant in the network so that is the issue so you should have additional power plants you should have them at a running level or to and especially wind of course now there is a development where you can predict wind so that you have to go to that level and even if you predict wind then they still you should have <coughs> power plants that should support these changes in predict even if you predict if you do not have power plants to support that there is no purpose so those are the linked issues to renewables and also in most of the renewables especially if you take wind the capital cost is 
relatively high and major portion of uh, both wind and solar is imported. So there again there is a foreign currency involved. Even though the full cost is not there the, for the capital cost you will be taking a loan or paying something and it will be affecting your foreign currency. So that aspect is there. So that is coming to the end of course we have only five or four minutes so I would just touch on what we have been talking about. I told you the importance of knowing the general figures, the level, the ballpark figure that is the word I want to say. What is the capacity of Sri Lanka? What is the capacity of the whole power plant in Sri Lanka? How much is the demand? Daily demand, what is it? It is in 2000. Sri Lanka's available capacity is 3000. And the energy amount needed for a day in Sri Lanka is in the range of 30 to 35 gigawatt hours. That is million units. We need about 30 to 35 million units. And in your day, in a house, about 185 uh, units are used. No, 180. 120 in that range we use and also we talked about uh, the, uh, uh, the transmission network the generation technologies and also the issues in the power sector and also the sectors players the laws there are three major laws the electricity act cb act and the pucsl act and the regulator is pucsl that we talk the regulated environment everybody has to take a license the issues with regard to licenses and the, and the major issues in the sector that is the subsidizing, selling lower uh, lower cost and on the other hand that having different uh, tariff categories, the net metering issue, the pros and cons of renewable energy and also the sudden policy changes, the effect of sudden policy changes and the issue of long term effects in decision making in power sector. So those are some of the things that we talked about. Of course most of the data that I produced here except are available in these things and also I would uh, suggest that if uh, maybe you have one month or two even for uh, this annual report of the national atlas uh, I got some values but just uh, if you have time go through it annual report of CBS uh, central banks annual report is a very good uh, document for you to read uh, for this uh, even answering the engineering B paper of course not the whole report there is chapter 1 which talks about the is analysis of the chapter and there is the statistical index at the start. Just glance through it and go through that first chapter. I don't know whether it is the first chapter or the second chapter. There is analysis of the country's uh, economies. They, are the, they talk about the energy, the telecommunication, the electricity, the transport. So all of your sort of questions are covered in a, with the links to economics. So the annual report in the CBS uh, Central Bank, it is in the web. The CB long term generation expansion plan uh, of course is uh, not uh, is now the next the other plans have come up. So it, they, if you go to the CB website there is a draft plan in the PUCSL also there is a draft generation plan. It will have these transmission lines as well as also some information on the coming and the CB website the PUCSL website and the uh, energy that is the SCA website. So most of this information is available on the web. So the information you cannot, I know, learn all this, but try to get some basic understanding of these uh, sectors, as I said, of the energy sector, of the electricity sector, the key uh, figures, the ballpark figures and the macro picture. So electricity in Sri Lanka is like this. It has hydrothermal, the thermal fuels are imported, there is a renewable energy component, it is increasing, coal is increasing, but it may decrease due to uh, the government policies. Is it right? It may be right in an environmental sense, but economically is it right? If it is economically not right, who will get affected? When affected? Those are the things that you should not, not try to learn by heart. CB has a board, the board members are this, not that. Just before closing, now this is something that I always tell to everybody. You know, we all know that this is a difficult exam. I might, we all found, find that because this is not our way. We all would like to answer, you know, write things in graphics or in calculations. But this is also necessary. So, this, as you have about uh, how much? One month or one half month? When is the exams? August? Okay. Anyway, just use simple English. This did now. I have not marked these papers, but this is what I have heard from the people who have marked. They have said that 
you have people try to write complex english then you get you you and long sentences don't do that start with a short start have short sentences they will not look at whether you, you know you you know literature or anything but if you try to do literature you will have to be correct noun ek ekata na ki ivara karanne verb ek wenahi oh you don't have a verb because you have so many long sentences don't do that and also read what you have written if you can of course it's very difficult when you are writing fast to read yourself but do that when you practice that is absolutely necessary because we have not i am not sure none of you have written a you know analysis analysis question exam for a long time other if if you not have may if you have done a mba or something very recently you would have done otherwise no maybe since sir o level panthi samaj adhyayanata itihase gana hari kavur hari gana liwata passe an analysis type of a question we have not done so that is the difficulty in this you have to think for both parts and also write according so that is why i said that uh, and legible handwriting whatever you write if they can't read you will not get marks so at least four question papers write answers and tell your friend to read it he also won't know whether you are right or on the answer but at least try see whether he is he can read it then you would know whether anybody else can read it or not so this is very simple i don't get angry with me trying to tell very podi deval kiyana kela but these are also important as much as the megawatts and kilowatts okay time is 7:15 i know all of you are in a hurry so i will not think about questions if you have any questions uh, my email address i can give it to you see uh, samita.midigaspay@cb.lk will find me shall i type it here Okay thank you